uh, as we go back into our, our study series that we've been doing on spiritual gifts. And uh, I'm excited that you guys are here as we continue to build into it. This is week two. Uh, if you were not here last week, uh, do me a favor. Go back, catch that podcast, um, whether it be audio or video. It really is pretty foundational for the rest of the, the study that we're doing uh, and what it means to your, your life. So it would be a good one to pick back up. We covered what spiritual gifts are for the, in kind of a basic understanding way. We covered uh, what different spiritual gifts are available that God uses. They blesses us too. We covered the fact that um, they are from God to you, so there's a purpose for it, and it's uh, something that Paul does not want us to be ignorant of. So if you are not here for that, uh, do me a favor. Go back, watch the podcast, listen to the podcast, make sure you get that in there, because it, this is huge. Again, if this is something that God himself has chosen to give to you, for a reason to be able to have passion in your life, your purpose in your life, to be able to serve with, to be able to be active within, then this is a massive topic. So if you missed last week, do me a favor. Go back, watch the podcast, listen to the podcast, get into it. There's a lot of really valuable things within that, within our spiritual gifts. If you have a background where you think, well, I was kind of raised the spiritual gifts are kind of weird and kind of be a little intimidating, and that just kind of seems kind of a science fiction-like t- type to me, so I've never really pulled into it. Or you're raised around spiritual gifts, but you've seen it used to uh, an extreme where it actually became a negative instead of a, a, a positive. Those are some of your backgrounds. I understand that. Do me a favor. Go back and watch the podcast. Listen to the podcast. You with me? I mean, this is a good one to dig into. One of the things we even looked at is how can you tell what spiritual gifts you have? Because we see in the Scripture that if you've accepted Jesus as leader and forgiver in your life, you have spiritual gifts in your life. It's, it's an automatic. It's not something where you get to sit back and say, well, everybody else has spiritual gifts, but I'm not like that person or this person or whatever the case may be. All of us have spiritual gifts. So we talked about how do you find out what those gifts are and how do you grow in those gifts. Uh, and one, one of those ways, uh, I, I, again, would say it's not the most prominent way, but it is a helpful tool to kind of get started, and all the instructions on how to use that well uh, are within that, that study uh, was the spiritual gift assessments, uh, which is something we offer for free for those within our church uh, online. So you can just go to tsflife.com, and there's these rotating banner pictures on the front. The first one's going to be the grief group that starts this week, and the next one's spiritual gifts. And you click it and follow the instructions, and it will give you some starting points on how to find what your spiritual gifts are. Because we're not supposed to be ignorant about them. We're supposed to be mindful about them. We're supposed to be growing within them. And we're supposed to be using them together. So if you happen to miss those instructions, do me a favor. Go back and watch that podcast or listen to that podcast. And make sure you catch up on it. Because it really is something that we need to move past apathy and move into passion with. Do you remember when we were looking at the pictures of family opening the present? We can either just be like, okay. Or we can really see this life-changing opportunity that's in front of us. Today we're going to change the focus a little bit because what we did last week, somewhat purposefully, but also um, I think is what we naturally tend to, is looking at spiritual gifts from what does that mean to me standpoint. We we tend to come natural, and we're actually going to talk about that some today as far as we individualize everything, where the scripture, quite frankly, talks about individuals, but how us as individuals come together as the church. And so we're going to move from kind of the individual standpoint of what do these spiritual gifts mean to me to what do your spiritual gifts mean to the church as we continue into our study. So if you would, let's go ahead and get our Bibles out and we'll get back into 1 Corinthians. We're in 1 Corinthians 12, starting out in verse 12. And he's going to have quite a bit to share with us uh, about this. I think it's going to take up, again, our, our, our entire time as we dig into this. So uh, hopefully, again, get those up and running. We've got youth versions up and running today. We've got uh, the Bibles in the baskets underneath the chairs around the room, but I think we're pretty good to just kind of read, dig in, and see what he has for us. Everybody good? Everybody there? Sweet. Let's dig in. Uh, This first section is really going to lay the foundation for everything else that we're going to talk about. So I'll, I'll read it loud and proud. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of the one spirit. Um, 
it was interesting to me coming into these voices when I was doing the study for our time together uh, for the message because I had already kind of gone through these voices from a standpoint of church membership on Wednesday. Uh, just like a little bit of a side note, um, I've I set, set apart a good chunk of time to write a new membership class for our, our church. And membership is something that, if you've been around for a long period of time, is something that my view of has kind of evolved over the last 15 years. Uh, has been reshaped and has been grown in some different ways. Because my church background, um, when I was a kid, it was more about uh, social church or politic church and those type of things. And membership meant kind of like being a member of a social club, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, so I kind of didn't like the word member. Uh, but then when we're digging into this from a standpoint of being a member of the body and all of us doing our parts, it's like, okay, that I get, that I can connect with. That really has some great implications on so uh, since we've not always been the best at educating on membership, following through on membership, living by membership into our discipleship model, uh, I, I just feel God's calling us to tighten that up a little bit. So I've been working on some things that will come to you guys soon, uh, and then we'll continue as a, a course that we do for people that are new or that we're reaching out to within the community. But it all really comes back to these voices in a lot of ways as far as the foundation, that we're all different members, but we're all one body, and the same is true within our spiritual gifts. Uh, when you look at all of us being different members, I, I think it's good to stop and really think about that phase, because I think some of us are so familiar with this, like, well, yeah, that makes sense, and then we're ready for whatever the voice is next. But for all of us to be different members, it really impacts how we act with one another and how we see one another relationally, because it's one of the challenges sometimes in the church is that we tend to... Uh, feel out of place if we don't look like everybody else or act like everybody else. Uh, in some church environments, there's kind of like this mold that this is what you're supposed to, to look like or act like uh, to be able to be like everybody else. Uh, it, it's so, so bad in, sometimes in the, in the church as a whole that um, in the 80s, I, I'm a big fan of a, a musician by the name of Steve Taylor, and I still follow him now, but his first big song was, I, I want to be a clone. He used a lot of sat satire and sarcasm to make points. I don't know why I like him, um, but I just, I always, I like the way he does things, but it's all about, you know, like you got to fit into this mold. We're, we're all supposed to be different. Um, I, I like the way that Troy Linville, I don't know how many people know Troy. If you've been around here for a while, you probably remember Troy and Shannon, the friends of ours that, that came to church for a few years, and uh, we stay in touch with them, and uh, the Emily's friends with their, their daughter, and they were just over at our house, like, to hang out at the campfire and stuff. I just, I, and I really like Troy Sh and Shannon because they're kind of artsy people, kind of poetic thinking people. They just kind of see things differently that, in a way I really enjoy. And when they were coming here, Troy was talking to me about his frustration with trying to make everything, like the church, big church as a whole, it wasn't like frustrated me or the church, but as, as a whole, uh, how that, that happens. And he compared it to a field of wildflowers. Like if you're out for a hike or you're at camp or a case where you come across a field of wildflowers and just how overwhelming it is, just how beautiful it is, that you've got hundreds of different types of flowers growing there. God put them there. It wasn't something that somebody planted. You got all the different colors and the hues and the textures and the heights. And it's just, it's beautiful. And one of the things that's awesome about it is it really shows off just how creative our God is. You know, God at the time of creation, he didn't like, oh, I kind of like roses. Here's roses. And then forgot about everything else. Like, you got a flower. Just be happy that you got a flower. It's just hundreds and thousands of all these different varieties that happen naturally that show off just how creative our God is and how it all comes together in a beautiful way. And he, he compared that to the church, that that's what we're supposed to do. And when we're trying to either force other people to look like us or we're trying to fake it so we look like we fit in, it really takes away from the beauty of this creative God that we have that brings all of us together naturally into one body. But it is one body. And that's something to really kind of think about as well, because especially in an age, and I'm probably getting myself out of order here, and I don't care, um, but when we live in an age where people say, well, I can be a Christian and not go to church, or not be part of a local body church, and I can just kind of do my own thing, and I've got Caleb, and I've got you know, Joel Olstein or whatever, and that's, that's my church. You're basically saying, I'm okay as a single wildflower, and I want to take that home because I want to capture some of this beauty, and you cut it and put it in the vase, it lasts for a couple of days, and then it withers, and it dies. 
It's outside of its natural environment. We are one body. We are all a part of it. And so he really wants us to kind of get our mentality around that. And so I was sitting at my, my desk, and one of the questions I asked myself on these things, and I think it's good to do in your study as well, is just what's the implications of this? What does that mean to us? And all right, so I wrote down some. I'm sure it's not an exhaustive list, but our note takers like some things to write down, so here you go. Um, if we really believe that we are multiple members making up one body, then one implication is we're not like the rest of the world. We are actually counter the world. That when you look at how things generally work, at least within our country and the way that our culture works, is if you've got a decision to make or you, you want something or you're placing a goal, um, there's really kind of two questions that's invited to go into it. What does this mean to me? How does this benefit me? And when I say me, I'm not just talking about Tom, but usually it, me includes my spouse if you're married and your kids if you have kids. How does it affect my circle? How does this inf- impact my, my immediate life? And then the other one that Paul's bringing up is how does this impact the church, the body that I am part of, and the mission that we have, how those two things come into place. And generally, our scale is very tilted towards how does this impact me. And I don't mean that from just kind of like this, oh, well, just so evil and we're so nasty standpoint. But in reality, I think all of us would agree it's just so natural that we don't even think about it. For instance, if you, let's say you're in your working years and you've got a job and you get a job offer, the first question you usually ask is, okay, am I going to make more money? Do I make more money here? Or do I have more opportunity here? Or what does this mean for my kids and being able to afford all the extracurricular activities that they have? Or, or kids, a lot of it's going to come into here. Where we have to move, what does that mean for my kids? with the school, it's going to be a lot of me questions as I work on that pro and con list on that piece of paper trying to figure out what my next step is. Seldom is this balance, I wouldn't even say balance, this actually needs to be tilted not as drastic, but a good amount drastic, of what does this mean for the ministry God's called me to? Maybe I'll make a dollar less an hour, but what ministry am I doing within this mission field that he placed me in? Would it be detrimental? Or is this something he's calling me to from a new mission standpoint? That's, that's a question I don't know too many people that think about when it comes to how they make decisions in their life. How does this impact the church, the body? Not one of the bodies. There's only one body. There's no plan B body. It's all the body of Christ. It's all the bride of Christ. How does this impact my part within that role? There's a really different way of living, and most of us don't go that way. Uh, there's a gentleman. I was meeting with a, a buddy of mine who's a pastor of the uh, Vineyard Neighborhood Church. Uh, they planned it two years ago here in, uh, in Marion. And it's kind of a home church that's worked together in the part of a larger body, which I like, uh, to make sure that they're staying biblically. But I was talking to JT, and JT has a buddy of his that's kind of like the associate pastor. I don't know what the actual term is. He lives in your neighborhood. What's his name? e uh, And I've met e a couple times. I don't know him as well as JT. But, um, and it's a plant from the Delaware Vineyard. And when they came up this way, uh, E-Day moved up here to be part of it, volunteered, makes no money at it. And to do so, that meant he had to quit his job and find a new job up here. That meant he had to leave his home there, and they got a new place to live up here. All because he felt God was calling them to be a part of what he was doing to further the Great Commission within the vision that JT had on his heart. Not too many of us think that way. I celebrate it. I think E-Day's a great guy. I really I love the mission that they're doing there. I celebrate that because most of us just don't go there. Versus, what do I need today? How do I survive today? So it really does mean that we are counter to the rest of the world. We should be thinking different. Uh, the second point, uh, I spent some time there, but uh, is the, the, the second implication is simply that we need each other. We need to be together. We need to encourage each other. We need to sharpen each other. We need to work together. We need to be able to be together. And so when I'm thinking about, okay, do I go to church once a month, or do I go twice a month, or do I want to go to a middle-of-the-week Bible study or not, and those type of thoughts, versus just what relationally is God calling me to, what ministry-wise God is calling me to, according to the Scripture, we need each other. It's the body working together. Third one is this, we're on one mission. We are all multiple, and we all have different ways of playing into that and plugging into that, and different environments with different churches, which is great, but we're all on one mission. The mission that we fall, go into ourselves first, come to Jesus, 
And let me stop for, there for a second, because I know I say this every week, and there's a reason for it, but what it means to come to Jesus, what it means to be a Christian, is that you made, make sure you're listening to this, and I'll tell you why here in just a second. Uh, besides the fact that it's the most important point I could ever bring up. Come to Jesus by acknowledging with your mouth He's the Son of God, believing in your heart He died and rose again, which means you're God, I'm not, I'm giving you my life, I'm following you, I accept your mercy and grace and forgiveness because I need it bad, and I'm following yours and then following Jesus. That's what it means to be saved. And the reason I want to hit that sometimes like that is because I do say it every week, and it's amazing how often I test people and just say, hey, just if someone asked you how to get saved, what would you say? Well, uh, gosh, what's, uh, you talk about it all the time, Tom. You don't have to shut up about it. Okay, let's see. And we stop and think. And I'm telling you, when you're in front of the person, just, you, you should be prepared to answer that question because if the answer is like, this is the most important thing to me ever and you need to come to Jesus, how do I do that? Oh, crap. What's the pastor say? <laughs> you're not prepared for that season. So and, and make sure you have. I, Andrew got saved last week. If you guys didn't see on Facebook, at the church, Andrew got saved. And, uh, and we, we were talking, and he claimed to be a Christian for eons and just never really kind of put those two together, that he never actually made a decision. It was just something that's part of his life. So it's important that we have that and to take that mission out, ourselves being saved, ourselves being baptized, ourselves growing our discipleship, so we can lead others to it. And we should be, if we have one head, that one body, and that, body, that, that is Christ, and we're in submission to him, and we're multiple members, part of that one body, then we are in unity with one another as we move forward. So we have one mission. And the next one, again, is some of us need to change our view of what church is. Some of us need to view, and even in our church, I love you guys, and we have, I'm so blessed here and so spoiled here um, compared to some other uh, church environments of my years growing up. But some of us need to change our view of what church is. It's not Sunday morning only, deal. It's not something that I like, I wear my T-shirt, and you know, so I've got a community that I can identify with. Uh, it's not a social club like I talked about before. Uh, it's not a status symbol. I know, I know some people that go to church because that particular church is seen as that's where the leaders of the community go and I want to be seen there. None of that is what the scripture talks about as church in any way, shape, or form. I talk to a lot of people. You, you don't want to find a church that fits your tradition or heritage. You want to go to, or even it just makes you feel good or has the best show, you, you, want, you want a community. You want Christian community where you're together and you're invested into one another um, and, and digging into that together. All these members working into this one, one body. So I think there's a lot of implications within it. Uh, I, I was just looking at a story, and I don't know if this would make sense or not, but a story yesterday, I was talking to somebody who owns a gym and like fitness center, and they were saying that their competition is not other gyms and fitness centers, it's Netflix. I was like, that makes sense. That makes sense. You know, what, what, what things are competing for you when it comes to you being part of the body? So those are some of the implications. That's some of the foundation he wants us to, to lean into as far as being, all these multiple members in one body. So let's look at some examples that he gives to us to kind of play off of to go a little bit deeper. Verse 14 says this, The body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. As we break apart this, this uh, particular section, I'm going to consider his help because I think it's interesting the parts of the body that he chose. I think there's some occasions with that that were put up here. He's got the foot and the hand, and then he's got a partnership between the air and the eye. When it comes to the foot and the hand, when we're looking at ministry, the foot is what takes you forward. The foot is that go part of the Great Commission. The foot is the traveling aspect. And the hand, when I think of the hand, I think of phrases like getting your hands dirty, serving, actually getting involved, doing something. And if we don't have feet that go, then the hands have a very limited radius. If we have feet that won't go all over the place, but we've just got our arms crossed, then there's not going to be a lot of ministry done there too. So I think it's interesting he puts those two together, that we need to have people that are willing to go, and we need to have people that are willing to serve. 
Now, I'm not saying some people are gifted and everybody else is off. I'm saying we are called to go and to serve and to do the Great Commission. When we look at the ear and the eye, the ear is what the hears of the needs of the community around us and the mission fields he puts us into. And the eyes are the ones that come up with the vision of how are we going to serve that? How are we going to fill that? And if it, people are doing their parts, what they're made to be and what they're called to be, that God chose and arranged us perfectly into, then we're going to lose those aspects. And when certain parts aren't working, we're going to find the things are challenge. And we'll leave that up for a little while, if you would, Sarah, um, as we go into the, these points. But I think there's another point within this that's not just interesting, but is convicting and challenging and hopefully encouraging. Because when he says, if the eye says it's not, it's not there, so it's not going to do this, the foot's not this, and this, I think I, when I glaze over this scripture, I think, okay, well, then they don't get to be part of the body. You know, they, they're pulling themselves out of the body. Um, and there's a multitude of reasons why somebody might do that. They, they don't, it might be insecurity, it might be past churchhood, it might be that they just don't see an opportunity to step into. There, there could be a million different reasons. And I want to be sensitive to that, and we'll talk about that as we go. But Paul makes a point here that's kind of strong and kind of needs to be considered. He says, if you, is my, my version of it, oh, remember the body and you are, period. If you accepted Jesus and forgiven forgiving your life, he's chosen his spot and you are a member of the body. And you, for whatever reason, are not stepping into that, you're still a part of the body. You still with me? You got to get this part to get the next section. If you are chosen and put into a mem- being a member of the body, for whatever reason or not stepping into that, time, schedule, money, whatever the case may be, you're still part of the body. You're just handicapping the body. You with me? It's not really an optional thing for a Christian. It's just whether or not you're going to be healthy or you're going to handicap the body. Now, again, I'm not trashing the reasons. If I lost the use of my left arm, there's a million different reasons why that could happen. Anywhere from me being stupid and doing something dumb to having a stroke and losing part of the use of my left hand side of the body. Understandable, great, great, but my arm is still handicapped. So we can talk about the reasons. We have to talk about the reasons, but we also have to get that reality. I'm a member of the body of Christ, and I'm either healthy within it or I'm handicapping the body. And when we're handicapping the body, that's when we see that the body is not able to perform the way that God has called the body to perform. That's when we start seeing emails about financial struggles within the ministry. That's when we start seeing emails of, hey, can people step up and help in the, the, the kids' ministry? Because we, we, we had some people step out and different reasons and all that stuff. Again, there's a lot of understandable stuff. Some stuff is not so much understandable, but nonetheless, it's there. When we start talking about those struggles, it's because somewhere within the mix were handicapped because people are not doing their part. Are you still with me? Anybody mad at me yet? Okay. So we really have to look at that aspect of things because when this all comes together, it's quite beautiful when it comes to the Great Commission. When it all comes together, it's quite beautiful when it comes to the love and the unity that we have for one another. Um, but when it doesn't, that's when people say, I don't want anything to do with church because they're a bunch of hypocrites. And so we really have to look at our health as a unit, as an individual, as well as the whole. And it's one of those things that it's good to look at now, like you're going into doctors to get a physical, before there's a big problem. Uh, from, again, when it comes to the body, there's a lot of different members to this old body up here. And you think after 50 years, I kind of know my body. I don't know all the names of all the members of my body. Uh, I, unless if you give them your own names, which is weird. But uh, I think, unless if you, thank you, Sheryl, I appreciate that, because I needed somebody to connect with my strangeness today. But uh, unless if you like go into the medical profession, um, the end of things, I, you probably don't know most of the names of the members. Uh, some of us are probably lucky to remember the old hip bones connected to the thigh bone. I don't know whether it's connected. I, I know the songs out there. I don't know those things. Uh, I don't think about it a whole heck of a lot until something's wrong. Right? Like, uh, like I've, got a, I've got a bad back, and I've talked to a couple people beforehand, um, and have for, for years, but I've learned that if I go to the chiropractor once every two months, I'm going to be okay. And if I don't, 
Like yesterday morning, I'll be sitting there brushing my teeth, brushing your teeth, and throwing out your back. Right? I hear you. I'm telling you, baby. I'm telling you. And he's only 32, but the... Aha, uh-huh, somebody finally laughed at somebody else than me. Um, but in this rib pub, it's Friday. I was like, I've been in the chiropractor for a while. I haven't felt much pain, but probably should go before something happens. Sure enough, Saturday morning when she's not anywhere around, now I've got a couple of days of kind of being a big baby and my wife taking care of me. Love you. But uh, we think about things when things go wrong. And when things go wrong within the body of Christ, before we catch it, then usually somebody gets hurt and it's not okay. So it's good to look at these things beforehand. So let's look at these from this, this truth from a couple of different perspectives. From your perspective, um, you're made for more. You're made for more. You've got purpose, a passion. He's called you. He's gifted you. You're made for more. And I have to wonder just how exciting of a life it is if you're an eye but you're blind. Or just how, how freeing it feels when you're, you're, you're taking in, uh, tr- trying to be an ear and you can't hear or you're deaf. Um, how fueling that is, trying to live out something when you're handicapped. Um, we're, just, we're, we're designed for better. Uh, from a church perspective, again, if we don't show up, we don't serve, we don't support, we don't do our p- part, we start seeing issues and struggles uh, within the church. When we look at it from a mission standpoint, we see that the mission is not being accomplished. Matter of fact, sometimes we find ourselves pushing people more away from Christ than pulling them to Christ. Uh, so this is a big issue we're talking about. When we're looking at your spiritual gifts, when we're looking about your activity, when we're talking about your service, how is that playing out within the body? When we continue looking into this, uh, you know, many poets, one body, one spirit, one, one mission, there's benefits to it. Start out in verse 21, if you would. Um, and I'm going to kind of pull these out because it's, it's one of those ones because you just put so much into it in one place. But he says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. No, again, the hand to the feet. That, that's called um, but pride. You know, that's, that's called self-focus. That's not what we're made for. Uh, we can't say, I have no need of you. Verse 22, On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on the parts of the body that we think less honorable... We bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable poets are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable poets do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the poet that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. I like when we go through this, and again, this is just kind of pulling some things out, when it talks about a greater life that you and I have available through the body of Christ. In other words, more that we can have than if it's just us. We can do more together if if it's not just me. We can experience more if it's not just me. And so some of the things that he he lists here, and again, it's all within the scripture, is again, kind of a re-hit that we need one another, and we have honor and we have modesty to one another, that we lift each other up, that we see one another for who we are in Christ, and we celebrate that, and we work together, that we're unified. So many people are looking for a brotherhood or a sisterhood where there's unity. That should not be modeled anywhere better than the church. And we're in one accord with one another, that we're showing up and that we're caring for one another. Uh, you, know, you know, in all honesty, side note, one of the most important things you can do ministry-wise is show up. One of the most important things you can do ministry-wise is show up. One for yourself, because I know you've got to be like me where there's nights you're like, oh, I don't feel like going to Bible study tonight. Netflix sounds pretty good. I think I understand what that gym owner is having. But then you force yourself to go to Bible study, and the next you know, like, man, tonight was awesome. Anybody else have that? I mean, that happens to us all the time. Four hands in the back, a bunch of no participants, and a couple of head shakes. Okay, good. But... For, for your own sake, the things that you get when you show up, even if, and I've, I've shared this before, even if you don't think it has anything to do with you, you know, if you think, well, it's just not, I'm just not into that, you'd be surprised when you come what God would do with it. But, but even beyond that, ministry-wise, we're on one mission. When somebody invites somebody to an event, let's say it's a woman's event here at the church, and they're having ladies' night, and Tony's gone out, she's talked to a friend of hers and said, 
Christ, you know, my church is awesome. I love my church family. We just really depend on Jesus. We depend on one another. It's great. The friend's like, I don't know about Sunday morning. That's Tim Jane. Come to the ladies' night. You know, come to that. And then you show up, and it's Tony and the friend and the leader, and that's it. What does that say to that friend? One of the most important things you do is just showing up and then using our spiritual gifts within that, just to be unified together, supporting each other in such a way. We care for one another. Where else do you go that we're commanded to suffer with, with everybody else that's suffering and to rejoice with those who are rejoicing? To have such a partnership that we have the emotions with one another and be able to go through those stories and what God's doing with that. If we all did this, Acts 2, 42 through 47 is not tough. If you've not been through that, one, you probably haven't been around here much longer than a month, and two, you really need to go to it. Acts 2, 42 through 47, what the church looked like at the beginning before we as humans screwed everything up. Okay, loving one another, caring for one another. No one had a need. People selling their excess to give the money to the uh, others. That, that's one of the reasons why I was celebrating Chris on Facebook yesterday. To do all that work that takes all year long to do a massive yard sale and then to put all that money towards helping people in need and missions instead of for yourself is a different way of thinking that thinks like the body that's unified with the Great Commission. It's a great example of what we're supposed to do and we can have that kind of life. But you can't do it if you're choosing to be blind, choosing to be deaf, choosing to be crippled, and choosing not to serve. So there's a proclamation that gives us, verse 27. And we'll put that one up on the screen, if you would. So uh, I know you guys have your Bibles open, but I want to break into this a little bit. But this proclamation is really what he brings us back to the very beginning. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. When you look at this, and again, you guys have seen me do this before, I, I like to underline certain parts to make sure we stop and rest at those parts instead of just going, oh, okay, he's just saying that again. Like the word now. Now. It's present tense. It's not sometime when you choose to do so, or it's not something that it used to be back in Acts 2, and maybe we'll get back to it sometime. Right now, you, if you accepted Jesus as leader and forgiving your life, you. If you haven't, I invite you to follow Andrew's lead in accepting today. Because there's a much better life than what you've been going. But if you accepted him, you, now you, are the body. You're one of the members, whatever it is, maybe from, from pinky to the neck, whatever you are. Well, the neck's always better. Anyways, we'll come back to that. But there, there's whatever member you are, you are it. Right now. How's it going? How are you doing your part? How strong are you? How much exercise do you need? What margins do you need to define to be able to grow, to be healthier? Before there's a big problem that hurts others or hurts you. Now, you are the body, the one body of Christ. He's invited you in, grafted you in, saved you into His body, His church. One God the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ. One Spirit, the Holy Spirit, unified as one. One ma Master, one Savior, Jesus Christ, in the garden, praying that we could be as unified as He is with His Father. You are the body of Christ. No other plan, no other body, no other way. You are the body of Christ. And individually, you have choices to make. Individually, you grow or weaken. Individually, you do your part or let the body be handicapped because you're a member of it. You're part of it. The mission, the life, the goal, the outreach, every single ounce. And it's a beautiful, oozing amount of love and truth within this body. You are a part of it. I was spending uh, some time with another pastor buddy this week. Pastor Brent um, is a newer pastor in town over at uh, Centerpoint Church. And I know uh, different ones of us have different connections to Centerpoint. I know Katie's parents go there and uh, work with their Celebrate Recovery or lead the Celebrate Recovery. Uh, Mike works with uh, Nathan, their worship leader, uh, is part of the Bone Marion. You guys got another one coming up, uh, not this weekend, but the weekend after Vineyard Church. Uh, and if you came a part of that, Nathan is the uh, California-looking hippie guy. Uh, love him. He's a great guy as a worship leader over there. And I, I, I used to be pretty good friends with the predecessor. 
And so I just kind of want to meet with Brent and, and walk him to town and get to know him a little bit. And uh, he's we've got a lot of similarities in. I, I've, I enjoyed my time with him. But we wanted to cover the history of the churches working together. Because again, I'm not just talking Shepherd's Fellowship thing. This is the church. And uh, I've been around for a long time now. I've been in town for 20 years, in ministry for 20 years. Um, we had Vantage Point looking at from a bookstore standpoint, from just a regular Christian standpoint, to a pastor standpoint, from a youth pastor standpoint. And so we were talking about just the history of things and how, you know, when I first came to town, churches just didn't really work together. It was really bad back, back in the day, but that we've seen a lot of great movement uh, within that. We've far from arrived, but we're seeing going from like 0% to uh, probably about 40% of the churches working together in different ways. And that, that's, that's encouraging. And we talked about uh, some of how that's come to be. We talked about some of the different groups in town, like uh, the Love, Inc. churches uh, that worked with Jenny and Love, Inc., uh, that uh, partnered to be able to help people in need, get a stronger foundation under their feet, not just economically, but spiritually, and connect them with churches and point them to the hope of Jesus Christ. We talked about uh, the pastoral prayer group that meets uh, every month to pray over the community together and to pray together and have relationships with one another. Uh, we talked about the IMA. A lot of you guys are familiar with the IMA. Uh, that we're, we're a part of that as well. Um, if you're not, it's traditionally the African-American churches here in town. And in the last few years, they've opened that up to all churches. And we're one of the pre predominantly uh, Caucasian churches that are a part of that. I'm um, the chaplain for that group. And that there's these different groups. And I was talking to him how he could plug into those and depending on what God's calling to be in part of his vision. And I shared with him, I remember like, even up to this like four years ago, there used to be a frustration in my heart that why can't we have one ministerial association? Why is it three, three groups? Actually, it's more than three. There's the Lutheran group that meets at Paneo on Tuesday mornings. There's other groups that meet by denomination. Why does it all these different ones? Why can't we just have one? And it's as I dove more and more, and especially once I joined on the IMA, I was sharing with him that I realize now why we do is because there's so much different uniqueness within the body of Christ. That all these groups are different for godly reasons. We're a big old field of wildflowers. And if we try to shove them all into one group or one focus or one vision, we're going to kill a lot of the beauty that's out there. And so um, I talked to him about Hope in Marion, which is an organization that myself and Pastor Ryan over at Central Baptist are over, that is an umbrella group where we can do things together, all of those groups maintaining their diversity but that we can have unity together, and like the National Day of Prayer was the last one that we had. So we talked about that from that standpoint and just how that really is kind of freeing for us to be able to all be together and move forward. That's what the local body church is. It's the umbrella. It's the umbrella where we come in and we have our uniquenesses, but we celebrate each other, we're in unity with one another, and we can do things bigger than I could ever do by myself. That I can get perspectives outside of my little comfort zone that sometimes can make us such a focused animal that we become a laser that burns and gives other resources that I would never have at my disposal because sometimes I need ears. I do okay on the eyes. I need ears around me. I, that's one reason I love our care team. I, I'm a vi vision guy, and I, I love being in a tribe with people, but I need additional ears that have hearts that we work together to be able to love on people. There, there, there's a great beauty within the body. We are multiple members of one body. How do you respond to that? There's three main sections to any of our Sunday morning gatherings. Worship through music, I guess for faithful, our financial faithfulness, the teaching, then how do we respond? How do we respond to this? I'll give you some suggestions. What's on your heart right now? As we're talking about these things, what things have you kind of clicked with and what things have kind of pushed you a little bit to make you feel a little bit uncomfortable? Capture those right now. Take those to prayer. Take those to study. Take those into the conversations because that's the Spirit speaking. That's the most important part to get. Second way to respond with this, and I suggest all of them, go back to your spiritual gift assessments. If you've not taken it yet, a lot of you guys have this week, and that's been phenomenal. If you have, go back and look at it again from a standpoint of what does this mean as far as me being part of the church. As we probably have got a good amount of time of whether or not we agree with it or don't agree with it. Or look at things to study. But look at it from a, 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 a bigger standpoint. If you haven't taken it yet, take it. Ask the individual questions and then the church questions and see what the Spirit puts on your heart. 
move into some prayers and conversations. Pray over it and start talking with people about it. If you say, okay, here's my three gifts, but I have no idea how to plug in. And there's two ways to plug in. One is to plug into a ministry of the church. The other one is do your own thing that God's leading you to and let the church know so we can support you. But what do I do? Set up time. I'll have coffee with you. I'd love to talk to you more about it. You've got friends and brothers and sisters around you. Set up some time. Talk about it. And the fourth one is this. Go for a walk. Go for a walk. Go to the park. Go for a drive. Whatever it is your thing where you're just by yourself and outside of normal life and just say, Spirit, can we talk a little bit? And you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. As you get into the Word, get a park bench, get into the Word, He'll speak to you. But don't let it go past. Don't be an individualist. We are the church. We are the church.